Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining tonight's panel discussion, 2021, the year for great grazing. I'm Emily Collins, Knowledge Exchange Manager, HDB Dairy, and I'm joined by this evening, Andre Van Barneveld, Robert Craig, Matthew Ingram, and Sarah and Duncan Howie. Thank you very much to all our speakers. So um, move on just quickly, a little bit of housekeeping. So all participants are muted and you'll, uh, this, you can see on the screen how you should be asking a question just in that side panel. You can type in your question. They're all anonymous, but please do just send them in throughout the presentation and we'll cover them after all the speakers have gone through their slides. And also for Dairy Pro points, if you're signed up to that, um, just provide your name, email and postcode and we can get those to you. Thank you. So this evening we'll be covering what makes a good grazing farmer and how you can improve your grazing management further and hopefully how to get the most out of spring grazing and weather fluctuations. And if you're watching this webinar or if you're watching it on catch up as well, we'd like to invite you to a follow up group discussion with Andre, which is next week. So please do email the ke.events at hdb.org.uk or call that number to to show your interest. Thanks. So we will start off this evening from Andre, thank you, um, who will let us know what, what he thinks makes a good grazing farmer. Hello again, yeah, thank you. Um, so obviously great grazing, uh, this, this probably covers so many people who might only just be starting and, and people that are well experienced in, in getting cows out grazing. So. Hopefully you all get something out of it. And the first thing I always say when you're looking at, uh, you know, to be a great grazing farmer is to recognise the value of, of pasture in the diet for the cows, recognising that it's highly digestible, it's got very good protein levels, and that a proportion of, of pasture in the diet at least is, is always uh, going to increase your intakes in cows. And then also recognising the difference, difference between well-managed and not so well-managed pasture. And so, Describing the fundamentals of grazing very, very simply um, in the next slide, uh, it's uh, next slide there. Um, it's operating within the ideal grazing window at all times, right? So, i.e., ensuring cows enter at the correct pre grazing cover and graze down to the correct pasture residual. So, I mean, in a nutshell, for me, that's what it's all about. It's always um, being really conscious what is the right pre-grazing cover for cows to go into and making sure they graze down to a residual that's not overgrazed, but it's grazed down to a level which we call 1500 kilos of dry matter per hectare around that three and a half to four centimetre residual um, that, that will ensure that the next grazing will have optimum quality again um, and, and so throughout the season. So then um, there's so many things that impact that and obviously the time of the year and the growth rates mean that um, it takes longer or less time to get to the right pre-grazing cover. Uh, and the next slide there. Um, just, there's so many things to consider and at the moment obviously if you're looking at turning cows out, utilisation is going to be one of your greatest challenges. It's wet, it's cold. Um, and if you're a spring uh, block carver, there's going to be less ap appetite in the cows at the moment. And so utilisation is a real, real challenge and you really need to take into consideration, you know, the, the lack of utilisation. Are, are cows only utilising 60% of what's disappearing? You need to be realistic about that. Consider substitution. So, you know, throughout the main season, by adding an extra kilo of meal, what are the cows going to drop out of their intakes and pasture? You might add a third kilos of, a kilo of meal and the cows reduce their intake by 0.9 kilos of dry matter of pasture. So, so you need to really be aware of the impact that it has and, and the impact that substitution has on the cow's appetite to graze down to the right residual. And the impact of the pasture reproductive phase, so when perennial ryegrass goes into reproductive phase, sort of at the end of May, um, yeah, you're, you're looking to go into slightly lower pre-grazing covers because that you're going to lose some of the digestibility as the grass is trying to go to seed. The cost of overgrazing is, is rarely discussed, but I think a lot of people that, that refuse to use a mower and try and push the cows a lot of the time to graze down to the right residual 
have massive parts of paddocks um, overgrazed down to perhaps two and a half centimetres. And you need to realise the cost of, of overgrazing on the pasture ability to recover from, from that uh, very low residual. Uh, and which leads you to the requirement for mechanical intervention. You know, like it's it's a it's a hot topic a lot of the time in grazing farmers, and, and people can get passionate about whether to or whether not to, whether to primo, whether to top after the cows. But it's recognising that sometimes there is a requirement for getting the mower out, and especially the higher your target output per cow for the for the year. The, the more you're going to have to resort to a mower sometimes to do the work rather than pushing the cows to do it. Uh, the impact that moisture deficits have in your system and how regular they are and how you prepare for them and, and what, what changes you make. You know, some people will change to maybe a 40-day rotation to, to maybe at least have something there, uh, whereas I would usually be advising 24 to 28-day rotations through, um, through very dry spells, so, so it's recognising the deficit changes required. And of course, fertiliser and especially nitrogen use. Um, is it to, to, uh, to fill a deficit or to create a greater surplus? And again, you know, pasture is of such high value at this time of the year, but when it comes to May or so, um, if you're already growing well in excess of your um, pasture demand, should you be applying more nitrogen to push that that excess even even greater um, and and how to use nitrogen efficiently economically and environmentally responsibly i suppose so there's so many considerations as far as um your, your pasture management so that, that covers a huge amount of things and, and it doesn't answer anything as far as um uh you know how, how it makes a grazing farmer but as long as you're always operating within that ideal grazing window, that for me is, is the absolute must. Um, so yeah, look forward to a bit further discussion on all that. Thank you, Andre. I think that gives a really good introduction to what you think makes a good grazing farmer and hopefully we'll have lots of questions coming in um, for people that, that want to um, delve further into those points. So just before we start with our next Farmer speaker, I want to launch a poll and and find out a bit about you, the audience, um, and how you would describe yourself. So there's a there's a poll on the screen now. Um, please select one answer. So would you? How would you class yourself as an experienced grazer, um, confident with the grazing principles, or maybe you're just starting out on your grazing journey? Um, you might be grazing, set stocking, but thinking of changing changing to paddocks and rotational grazing. Um, or other, please let, just let us know in the in the questions. Leave that up a little bit longer. Okay, thank you. Um, results. Oh, okay, so we've got we've got a good range. Um, Thirty-four percent experienced, um, forty percent confident with the grazing principles, and nineteen percent starting out on grazing journey, um, and three currently set stocking. Thank you. It's it's interesting to know and good to see how we can kind of balance what we're talking about. So that leads us nicely onto our next speaker. Thank you, Robert. So I think you've got a, a great wealth of experience on a couple of different units. So if you'd like to talk to us about your experience and what you think has made you a good grazing farmer. Okay, and uh, good evening to everyone. And thank you for the invitation to come and talk to you this evening. I'm gonna sort of set the scene a little bit as to the journey that we've been on. It says that pasture-based dairy farming 25 years on, and it's been a journey really that's um, two and a half decades since we sort of first got the exposure to a bit of a bit of New Zealand thinking, if you like, via Ireland. So the first uh, New Zealand consultants that came to the UK, uh, they came over from Ireland. And, and it was at a time, so this was mid 1990s, where the industry that we're involved with, our sort of peers were heading in the opposite direction, away from grass, high index Holsteins, high yields, um, uh, and, and we'd largely forgotten how to value grass. So 
So back then we were we were about 150 acres, 100 cows, fairly typical, 300 breeding sheep, uh, quotas holding us back. Um, and we started to learn about grass. We started to learn about measuring grass and allocating grass on a daily basis, actually quantifying the value of grass and seeing the potential in it. Um, you know, talking about infrastructure and paddocks and uh, fences and water troughs and things, completely alien really to what the direction of the industry at that time, but quite exciting. But actually, I thought, I thought at that time we were quite good at what we're doing. But um, you know, one, once you actually realize what you don't know, um, you, it really you know, wakes you up and it was just at the right time for me. So if we move on to the next slide, Robert, I'll just say we can't see you. I'm not sure if you can. Uh, people, people, yeah, well, I, it tells it tells me people can see me, but never mind. Oh, it's probably the slides no are mind. important. As long as you can hear me, that's the main thing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so yeah, fast forward uh, two and a half decades, uh, and the business is quite a bit different now. So uh, farming now just short of um, 2,000 acres on three different units. So the home farm is Kenhead Farm there. Uh, that's sort of grown from uh, a fairly small family farm, just me and my father, to you know nearly 500 cows now. Uh, we're involved in another business 20-odd um, miles south of us, Dolphinby Farming Partners, with Steve and Leslie Brandon from Staffordshire. So we're milking 550 cows there. That's a, a tenancy. Uh, both those farms are spring blocks. Uh, you'll see the Kenhead Farm is slightly tighter block than Dolphinby. Uh, and then we took on the tenancy of PP Farm over in Northumberland uh, just over two years ago. Uh, and we've got a split block over there. Uh, so we managed to mop up our empties from the other two farms over there and they sort of supply the autumn block. Uh, there are reasons for, I mean, it's a particularly dry area of Northumberland, that, so that sort of fits in quite well. Um, to manage very similar principles to the, you know, all three farms are all pasture based. Uh, I'll go into the sort of key uh, KPIs in a minute, but um, you know, we're doing about 6,000 litres off the spring farms, around about sort of 5, 10, 5, 20 kilos of milk solids off anywhere from about a tonne to a tonne and a quarter of, of supplement uh, feed gone in there. PP is a little bit different. We're about 6,500 litre herd average there, um, 570 kilos of milk solids and about a tonne and a half, 1.4 tonnes of concentrate concentrates going into there so um lots of cows lots of people 20 plus people actually on on them units now as well so i've had to learn not just how to manage grass but manage people as well so if we move on to the next slide i'll briefly go through the the sort of key drivers if, if you like over the last over the last two decades or so as we've learned fairly simple targets these uh, and i'll move on to what were things that are changing as we go on we sometimes grow 14 tons, don't always grow 14 tons. Generally, the weather plays a part in that. We can easily hit the sort of 500 kilos of milk solids. Um, good herd of good herd of cows, really important to hit all these targets. You've got to have good infrastructure and the right genetics. So that goes without saying. Really fertile cows, New Zealand cows, um, you know, really get back in calf very easily. So we're easily hitting those empty rates now and uh, and calving, um, calving rates as well and replacement rates. So that that is those are the targets that have sort of held, held us in in good stead if you like over the last couple of decades and allowed us to build the business things are changing now we're, we're going to have to start setting new targets in, in around sort of soil organic matter soil organic carbon greenhouse gas emissions um really we're going to have to get very clever about using our own nutrients more effectively uh we're starting this year to, to take control of that on one farm we've bought our own slurry spreading gear and we're going to be following the cows around with slurry and really using those nutrients as a, as a more effectively, I think, through, through the growing season. There's cost involved in that, but actually we need to take control of that uh, and try and make the better use of that. I can see a day coming where nitrogen is going to be either taxed so that it's uneconomic or actually legislated that we'll not be able to use, use it to grow grass. And I don't think that's so far away, really. Um, we may even, to give ourselves a little bit more control in the future, start to make our own silage again. Both of those jobs I never thought I'd ever go back to doing again. Um, we've obviously got the scale there that we can we can possibly do it either, easier than some, but it, it does involve huge quantities of, of machinery that I thought I'd left behind a long time ago. Um, interestingly also, we're, we're looking at more diverse swords, so maybe using, using plantain in with ryegrass and clover mixes uh, to, to, to sort of try and make at least one of the farms a little bit more drought resilient. Uh, the farm over in Thumberlands particularly hit 
with drought. So I've probably used up my five minutes, I would imagine. Um, I could probably talk all night about this, but we can go into a bit more detail during questions later on. Okay. Thank you, Robert. Yeah, no, that's that's been really good. And we've got um, a couple of questions already coming in about uh, multi-species swords. So that will definitely be coming up soon. So that leads us nicely, thank you, on to Matthew. So Matthew, I think you're um, going to talk to us about the kind of right attitudes for a grazing farmer and you've got five key points. Yeah, so good evening everyone and thank you for listening and thank you for having me. So I, I thought that I would try and show you um, with a few pictures what, what how we've interpreted really what Andre was talking about and also um, you know, it's a very similar system to what to, the, to what Robert's running, and I, I identified five key things really that I thought that you need to be a, a good grazing farmer, or probably a good farmer generally. And and I think actually, despite all the talk about grass species and cows and spring block carving and sheds and whatnot, actually the most important thing is probably your attitude. You've got to want. Firstly, you've got to want to milk cows, and secondly, you've got to want to milk cows from a grazed or a pasture-based system. And you've got to believe that you can do it, because it's, it's easy to look out of the window now on the, whatever it is, the 9th of February, and think, oh, there's just no way I'd be able to graze cows before the 16th of April. But um, if you believe that you can do it and you want to do it, you'll find a way. And so the first picture that we've got here is just an aerial shot from, um, oh, I should have said probably that I'm in a contract contract farming arrangement on, on, on the farm. So we've got about two, we've got 138 hectare grazing platform and I'm on, a, on about a 2000 acre estate. And I'm in a contract farming arrangement with the Corley family, Lord Corley and his son, William. And uh, my I started in 2005, my first contract. We milked about 130 cows so one man, as a one man unit. And I just bought the cows and machinery as they were on the farm. And then when William Corley, his son, came home in 2013 to take over the estate, um, he wanted to upscale the dairy. And, and the picture you're looking at in front of you now more or less shows the extent of our grazing area. So at the top of the picture in the middle, you can see um, the buildings and you can actually see uh, running at sort of across the top of the picture, the railway sleeper track that we built to take us out to the paddocks on the top right hand corner of the picture. And then there's another track comes sort of down the middle and you can see the cows have walked down that track and they're grazing. And you can also see that it's very early in the season. There are no, no, I would guess, I don't know exactly, but I would guess that's sort of the last week of February, first week of March. So I suppose I've identified um, the, your attitude. So you have to have the attitude, I mean, on a big, we've got 500 cows on, a, on our sort of scale, you definitely need tracks. Uh, so you've got the attitude that you want to get out there and you really do have to put in some sort of trackway system and water system. Could I have the next slide, please? Clearly, you know, we're an autumn calving herd and uh, you may be, I, I mean, obviously 75% of you already have uh, a confidence with grazing, grazing principles, but uh, I, I feel like maybe sometimes, you know, we think about grazing and we think about extreme, the more extreme end of the grazing spectrum where you have no, no buildings and just a milking parlour. Um, realistically, I would say in the UK, we're perhaps moving beyond that being a feasible way to farm in the current climate. Um, but you can see the investment that we made in 2015, which was a slurry lagoon at the bottom of the picture and a 510 cow cubicle shed with solar panels on the roof. And then there's another slurry lagoon on the right-hand side. We converted um, uh, an old loose yard into a new milking parlor with collecting yard behind it. And then on the left-hand side, there were some existing buildings. So it's, it's a very substantial investment in infrastructure that we've made at the same time as upscaling, but it has enabled us to, um, to, to, to graze from usually about the middle of February to the middle of November. But notwithstanding that, we have the sort of infrastructure I would suggest that most of you have got on your farms or are thinking about building. So I suppose that brings me on to my third point, which is you do actually have to have, notwithstanding the tracks and the water, you still have to have the infrastructure so it's the attitude, the tracks, the infrastructure, the buildings, don't discount, don't think that you can get away, you know, that we should be doing it with no buildings and, uh, and no infrastructure. That's our herd of cows. So I think Robert identified and I would agree that it's very important to be very realistic about the genetics that you're milking. If you're thinking about taking the first step on a grazing system, you may very well have 
eight and a half or nine thousand litre Holstein cows, you probably can graze those very successfully. But it's, it won't be any good thinking that you can turn them out in February and they're going to continue giving 30 litre average milk yield. They're not going to do it. It's probably not fair on the cow. We, we're not as far down the grazing journey perhaps as Robert. We started grazing, extended grazing in 2005, six. Uh, initially very enthusiastic about um, a sort of hardcore Jersey cross region, but actually for an autumn calving system, I think we've decided that it really we need a, a more Frisian type cow giving more towards about 550 kilos of milk solids. And that's sort of roughly where we are today. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, that's our milking parlour, because obviously all dairy farmers would love to look at a, a milking parlour. It's a 40 uh, swing over, 40 a side swing over Waikato. Um, I get a lot of stick in grazing discussion groups for all the toys we've got. We do have ACRs in there. It's a two man parlour at all times, but we would be uh, quite easily capable of milking about 280 cows in that middle in, in that middle hour. Obviously it takes a little bit of time to start up and a little bit of time to slow down, but in that middle hour when everything's flowing, we can milk 280, 280 to 300 cows with a full with a full uh, pre-wipe and all that routine. Um, next slide, please. I'm conscious of the time. Yeah, so again, that's just me banging on about infrastructure, but it's just the inside of our cubicle shed. Um, we, you know, we we may only we may only house our cows for 100 to 120 days a year. But there's absolutely nothing stopping us if you know circumstances dictated they could live in that shed all year round I suppose it's just you know people comment that we spend a lot of money and we then try very hard not to use it but that's just the fact of the fact of uh, grazing in this country I think uh, I don't think that I've got anything else to say thank you no thank you very much Matthew and I should say um, Matthew is a, or what was and is a um, British grassland um, grazing mentor and actually was the grazing mentor for our next speakers Sarah and Duncan Howie who are a little bit more recent to their kind of grazing journey um, but doing really great things so we'll start off thank you Sarah and Duncan. Uh, evening everyone um, we milk 300 cows in, um, in Shropshire just outside Shrewsbury um, we've got a grazing platform of about 100 hectares and between since 2016 and now we've transitioned from milking 280 cows from an all year round system which were housed about half of the time um, we're now fully in an autumn block system having had two years split block last year being the first year that we were fully autumn block carving and um, we farm with my parents who've been here having been carving all year round um, and have come with us on our journey to do more grazing and carving in autumn. Um, so a little bit surprised as to why we're here. I think, as I said to Matthew the other day, I think kind of what can what can we explain? And that's knowing nothing about grazing and trying to learn a bit about grazing and making a few mistakes along the way. And ultimately, that's where we are at the moment, which is still on the journey. Um, and I would so there's two two things I think. Uh, pick up on which have already been covered but would be open your mind up loads of stuff is possible you'll be told by a lot of people a lot of stuff isn't possible but just try it you sometimes you do get things wrong uh, just as long as you just know how how bad that mistake could be just don't hopefully it's not too bad and the second point is infrastructure don't underestimate how much infrastructure you will need and and get your head around why you need that infrastructure so um what you hopefully you can see on the screen in front of you at the moment is kind of what we what we've done the blue lines are, the, are where the tracks are most of them are now railway sleepers um we've tried various different tracks and decided that railway sleepers are the best for us and most of those paddocks are 3.2 hectares in size which is a 24 hour grazing for us uh, we put a, a break fence up at 12 hour um, yeah, and so a lot of water, um, water troughs gone in, a pressurised water system, railway sleeper tracks, electric fencing. Um, and we've done most of that ourselves. Obviously, the railway sleepers were installed by a contractor, but the majority of that work we have done ourselves. 
we, we could have got the contractor in to do a lot of that work. But for us, coming from um, kind of a, as almost new entrants into farming, we had a lot to learn and I'm pleased we did do a lot of that work ourselves as that meant we knew how to fix stuff when it went wrong and we understood the value of fencing and how it works and we learned a lot on that journey. Um, have you got anything else to add on, on infrastructure? Yeah. So you can, if you click on to, the next slide, it's got the inset bit. Um, these are the kind of the main problems we faced of starting to graze. Um, you can see the buildings. We've got about um, 30 acres straight behind the buildings, which the cows can walk straight out from. Otherwise, we have to cross the lane, which our next door neighbour uses. We've quite a busy farming operation up there, so we have to cross the cows, cross the traffic. We then have to cross the main road to get to at least half of our grazing and cross the brook in that one or two places. So you can see the long, thin field between the road crossing and the brook crossing. Initially, that was used as a track, so we were probably losing about two and a half hectares for the sake of a track, if that makes sense. We graze it once and the cows are just tread it up for the rest of the summer. Um, so we, luckily the Environment Agency helped us build a, br a bridge, which we are now across the brook with. Um, and having made a lot of improvements in terms of our infrastructure to be able to graze better, our next priorities, which are this year, we're going to put in a cattle grid on the lane so cows don't have to stand after milking. So the improvements we've made with our grazing, if we can just get the cows into those paddocks for longer, we should be able to improve even further. And we've also got we'll put in a planning application for an underpass under that main road, which we cross morning and evening at rush hour, basically. So we get kind of 30 or 40 cars a minute. Um, so it'd be great to be able to cross the road much easier. So, yeah, we've made a lot of infrastructure investment and we're now kind of looking to fine tune a lot of it. Yeah. Uh, can we move on to the next slide, please? If that's all right. Key thing I'd just say whilst we're waiting for that is, I said, open your mind up a bit, is um, grazing, you know, uh, discussion groups, make sure for the 25% of you that this is all new and you're thinking about getting involved in it, you know, get involved in discussion groups, definitely. Um, if anything, just the practicals, just when to turn cows out, just what the stuff that the textbooks, it all seems a bit complicated. Discussion groups make it real. You can then get advice on what to do and what not to do. And this is, I suppose, what we're aiming for, which is just utilising more grass, margin over purchase feed, getting it from grass out in in the paddocks. And that just shows a bit of the story of where we've where we've taken it to. Still a long way to go, not perfect by any means, but now up to kind of 13 tonnes of dry matter a hectare. You can see by the number of paddocks as well that over the last few years we've brought in what was down as a lot of arable ground, we've brought that back into grass. So we've got more paddocks to graze and actually this year we've got even more paddocks to graze as we've got some more land with the neighbour which is brilliant but you can also see probably from the green and yellow bars we've learned probably the hard way that getting a blade over everything once a year is as Andre mentioned earlier really important in terms of regrowth so last year we got around most of the paddocks in terms of learning you can see there's a chunk of the 19 20 and 21 f that we didn't get to um didn't get to mow it's because we were late rolling them they were reseeded we were late to roll them so we couldn't well, no one will put a mower over them to risk their mower. Um, so yeah, all st still learning, but from that, I think you can see that we've come quite a long way. Really great. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah and Duncan. Wonderful. Um, so just now, just before we, I've got lots of questions coming in. I'm just gonna share another poll um, and try and find out from the audience what your biggest aims are this greasing grazing season. So if you can select all that apply, um, we've got improved infrastructure, tracks, fencing, water, um, in, increased grass measuring frequency, days grazing and that's milk and forage, um, improving your, your or your staff's knowledge and attitude to grazing, like Ma Matthew said, um, including multi-species swords, boards, we'll definitely be going on to that or if it's utilising slurry and farmyard manure better. Just waiting to hear from you. And people might be tempted just to tick them all, but try and um, <laughs> tick your main in.
right, we'll go there. Uh, wonderful. So I think you can all see the responses. I mean, fairly across, fairly even across. Um, lots of people wanting to utilise slurry better. Um, still improving your start, yours or your staff's knowledge and attitude. Really interesting and in, including multi-species swords as well. Okay, thank you for that. Right, so discussion. I'm going to kick off with with a, a preloaded question before I um, before I go through everything we've got. Um, so we've heard from Andre what what he thinks um, makes a really good grazing farmer, um, and I just wanted to hear from the rest of the panel what you think. So you know you've already got those attitudes but what are your aspirations for the grazing season in 2021 so we'll start with with robert so you've got a few different sites yeah so i'll, I'll go back to um using that slurry more effectively really i think there's two sides to that there's, there's using less nitrogen so i want to be able to do it i'm fascinated by how the organic uh, side of the industry manages and they, they can grow phenomenal amounts of grass um without the use of chemical nitrogen. So we've got a huge resource there because we've been using or locked into using contractors. We're not using it when it's most advantageous for us. It tends, they tend to dictate when it gets spread rather than us because it's very difficult to get a busy contractor that's making silage in the summer to come and spread dirty water or slurry behind the cows. So we're gonna use that more effectively, get it in behind the cows probably out most weeks with a dribble bar behind the cows try and capture the real value of doing that and hence save quite a bit of nitrogen, hopefully. And if it works well on the home farm, it's, there's no reason why we shouldn't then roll that out across uh, the other the other two units uh, in due course. That's great. And do you have any goals of how much more grass you'd like to, or the product, productivity of grass, you'd kind of need to see that improvement? See so, that yeah. yeah. I would, I would like to save 100 kilos of N. We're, we're using between 2 and 240 kilos of, of N per hectare at the moment, which isn't massively high. But I do feel we've got to get ourselves in a position whereby we've, we're going to learn to do without that in the future. So whether support payments are reliant upon it or legislation or even our milk contracts, um, you know, this is coming. This is, you know, this is all coming down the track. So the sooner we learn to live without it, you know, the better. So, and it, you know, it's, it's, it's better for the environment, it's, it's better for the soils. Um, and I'd also like to do a, a bit of trial work with uh, multi-species swords. We're going to do that on one of the farms uh, coming up this, this spring. So we'll, that's a, a step into the unknown for me. We've been very much um, praying on ryegrass and clover swords until now. So a bit of a mission of discovery. All right, thank you. I know we will be covering that. Um, uh, Matthew, what about you? Your um, <laughs> Well, it's not necessarily something I can really control, but uh, last year was, uh, there's a common misconception that the autumn carvers had it real easy last year with the drought, because oh, of course all our cows were dry when it was, uh, but we run, we run a stocking rate on our grazing platform of just shy of four cows per hectare, and we, we, uh, we had actually no grass at all on the farm by the end of May last year, and then by July all our cows were dry and we, we were buying hay because we had no grass again. So I suppose my, my aspiration is really simple. I just like a more normal year, please. We can cope with, uh, we know, we, we, in, terms of the, in terms of the grazing, it's no drama. We just need a little bit of dry weather in February and then some rain through April and May. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's it's quite simple, my end. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sarah or Duncan? Um, I think probably for us, we've got, more of the same in terms of more of what we've done last year on the grazing side of it and the real challenge for the next year two years is, is improve the system in terms of making it easier for the team to use so that will be underpass and or a solution to the road and a solution to the lane and so if we can carry on doing something over 13 tons of dry matter that's great but we just need to make this, the, the system easier and that will mean some spending money to get there but if we're going to safeguard what we do here we're going to need to do it. okay thank you so we'll go back to you andre um with regards to multi-species swords what is the best pre-grazing height to go in at and what utilization should you be looking to achieve if grazing too low a residual are you putting likes of plantain and chicory at risk 
So that's quite a lot of detail. I know there was a question before that of just any views on herbal lays. So maybe kind of start broad and get more detail. Uh, look, it's a tricky area, the, the herbal lays thing um, or mixed species swords. I mean, the first thing is to actually be conscious of what you're trying to achieve. And, and I'm over here in New Zealand now um, for the last couple of months and looking around at the same thing. And I feel that people are very confused about why they're actually doing it. Um, there's a real pressure on here to reduce the, the, um, the nitrate leaching in the urine patch, which seems to be the main driver. Um, a lot of people will be doing it to try and get more consistent growth through summer dry periods. Um, you know, then we've got the whole regenerative farming uh, discussion going on with, with huge misinformation. Um, the, the public love it, social media loves it because you know, it's touchy feely. But there's so much misinformation. I, I, I don't believe uh, half of it is true. Um, we don't need to be regenerative to be um, environmentally respons responsible as such. So you need to decide what you want to do. Do you want to go to that um, high pre-grazing, high residual regenerative type of system where you uh, focus on leaving a lot of trash behind to then feed the soils? Or do you want to fit multi-species into a, into a conventional system? And, and for me, I push multi-species and herbal lays into, into conventional systems where they have to cope with what you're trying to achieve. So I'd be, I'd be very much um, still trying to do the same thing, focusing on a, on a highly um, digestible, high energy diet for the cows, but in a herbal lay system, that means you can go into slightly higher covers um, and, and um, and, and leave slightly higher residuals. So um, again, it's what you include. If you're going to include species like your, what I call the cardboard grasses, um, if you're going to include fescues and cockspots and timothies into, into those sort of species, into the, into the swords, then it's completely different than just adding chicory and plantain and the herbs, right? So if you include the herbs, then you can, you can uh, allow them to go slightly higher pre-grazing covers and still have reasonably good um, ME per kilo dry matter and digestibility. But if you have the, the grasses that, that, uh, that I mentioned, if you go to much higher pre-grazing residuals than over that 3,200, 3,500, you, you're trying to force cows to eat material that has just lost so much quality. And even the premium rye grasses in there have gone to the four leaf stage. So, you know, once you get past that three leaf stage, that, that ryegrass plant is developing a fourth leaf, the first leaf is dying off, and you're losing the digestibility, you're losing the energy per kilo dry matter, and you're going to a completely different system. So we can we can have a discussion about this for, for four hours, um, but the first thing I have to say to people thinking about it is, one, decide what you're trying to do. Are you trying to fit it into a conventional system or change the system? And, and if you're trying to stay in a conventional system, is, is, um, it's not allowing it to go much greater than, than your current pre-grazing and, and residual targets, uh, maybe about a centimetre each way. Um, and, um, and, and why are you trying to do it? And, and also just I keep hearing nitrogen, um, chemical nitrogen, we all think it's the devil. It's not. The overuse of chemical nitrogen is what's the problem. So using using the herbal lays, making sure you try and get some legumes into that to supply a lot of that nitrogen is, is a huge part of the reason. So yeah, it's it's how long is a piece of string? But yeah, you know, I can go into a whole different area of it again. You know, the persistence of those herbal lays at different grazing heights and all those sort of things. But um, I'm not sure how interested people are and how much time I'm going to spend on it. No, that's all right. Thank you. We do have, um, there was a series with British Grassland on herbal lays. So um, if anyone's interested, they'll all be available on YouTube. Any comments from that before we move on from, from Robert or Matthew, or if you're thinking about it? Probably the persistence, and that would be my my concern. Would be I wouldn't want to be having to be ploughing up and reseeding these things. You know, we've we've we know grass, we know it. You know, it, it'll get through the most severe drought and and a good few weeks of rain, and it's back again. But you know, the persistence of this being grazed or cut, that would be my concern really as to whether or not you know we'd have to be re-sowing this stuff every three or four years. Okay, thank yeah, you. Yeah, I think that's most people's concern, and that's why I'm. 
a little hesitant about really pushing them into conventional systems too much. And that's where plantain has probably answered all our questions and being able to survive and, and you get reasonable persistence to pay back, you know, for a payback on your investment. But then, you know, different areas, different things. Some of the real dry areas in the UK might suit chicory or a perennial chicory. Um, and, and others, you know, if you're kind of wetter, they'll be gone in a year's time, you know. So it's just just trying to figure out the different soils, your different systems, and what fits into it. And for goodness sakes, talk to people that have actually been doing it and, and look at the system they're running it um, to decide whether you're going to go down that track, really. Mm. Okay. Thank you. I think we've got a couple of questions on, on mowing and integrating silage. So in this country, we'll need to produce winter forage. Does it not make sense to grow as much grass as possible and weaving in the grazing and silaging to give high quality gra grazing? Um, and a kind of linked question was thoughts on pre-mowing, um, baling 3,400 kilograms of dry matter per hectare, not that useful pre-mowing best option. So Andre, do you want to give a couple of comments? Yeah, it's actually a, an area that I'm, I'm, I'm sort of writing articles about at the moment, I suppose, because when you look at the cost of um, of taking out surplus grass, so firstly, people are, are loading on nitrogen to grow this this uh, surplus to then cut into, into most of the time bales. And when you work it out, the real cost of those bales is sitting uh, pretty high, well over 30 pounds a bale. So it's not it's not actually very good value silage and then people say it's high quality it's not high quality like if you if you've got a crop of silage you're always measuring uh nitrogen content and, and checking um that things are right for harvesting and yet we mow these surplus bales with massive nitrate levels that are not actually making rocket fuel silage if you if you send samples away from your surplus bales you'll find that they come back uh usually at lower values than your first first cut silage so for me it's all about your grazing and it, it, it makes a, a grazing system very um, high risk to drive your growth rates much beyond 100 kilos of dry matter per hectare per day because now you're having to evolve into much quicker rotations to on your grazing platform and taking out more of your area to to mow for um for surplus which actually introducing a lot of introduces a lot of risk into your system. So for me, it's not economic. It's not the right thing nutritionally for your cows to be going onto onto very um, short rotations, and it's not always right. It's uh, to to grow as much grass as you possibly can. So I, I disagree with the concept to just grow as much grass as you can because it's not the right nutritional pasture for your cows. Um, what what's left to graze. And it's not actually your best silage, and it's actually a very expensive silage. So for me, my advice would be grow purpose uh, grown silage and focus on doing the best possible thing for grazing nutritionally for your cows. Uh, and yeah, pre-mowing. <laughs> um, pre-mowing or or, um, or topping, I, I, I have a, a flow chart that I use. So, you know, you, you assess every time you open the gate for the, for the cows, is this the right, cover for the cows to be entering for them to achieve a residual willingly and if you look at it and you say well no if i put them in there they're not going to graze down to my 1500 cover willingly then you have to ask firstly is it surplus should it be coming out for surplus and, and do i skip it to go to the next paddock if the answer is no you need to need to graze it then then the next question is um would i be happy for all the material that's in here to be inside the cow like, is it still a good pasture, good quality pasture, but they just wouldn't graze it down? And if the answer is yes, you primo it. But if there's a lot of seed heady stuff in there you'd prefer not to have in the cows, then you graze it, graze it and, and, and post mow it. So that's, that's, that's my flow chart. Hmm. That's, that's a good flow chart. Matthew, you were nodding along there. Yeah. I agree. I agree with everything that Andre says, but I, in some ways, I disagree with quite a lot of it too, uh, I, because it de it depends on your overall stocking rate. So if if Andre is sitting in New Zealand and he's maybe visiting a farm that maybe is only stocked at 1.9 or two cows per hectare, then that's very different to someone who's sitting in the UK with a stocking rate maybe of three cows per hectare, because uh, we all know, don't we, that a long-term sustainable stocking rate across the whole farm is about two point 
three cows per hectare. And if you're sitting at that stocking rate, then it shouldn't really, in my mind, be at all a problem to have um, surpluses that you cut and you may, you may want to allow them to grow on. And, and if you do, you've got to be aware that you are introducing risk into your, into your grazing system or you may want to take them out. Now, I'm, I'm, I've, I've got absolutely no interest in making bale silage. I've never, I don't think we've ever made a bale of silage. I've got no intention whatsoever of starting. But we do open up our silage clamp Oh, it could be every week or every 10 days, putting a little bit of grass in from somewhere. So I suppose in a nutshell, my advice would be to make sure that you can feed your cows for the next 10 days to a fortnight. And we, we're quite, you know, we're quite keen on cover per cow. Uh, and, and, and you don't want it to go too high, but you don't want it to go too low either. So it's a case of on a, on a not quite a daily basis, but certainly twice a week. You need to be asking yourself, is it going to rain? Am I going to have enough grass? Is the surplus getting out of control? Am I going to take a couple of paddocks out? So, so I sit somewhere in the middle because we do both. We run a very high stocking rate on our grazing platform and we grow 80 acres of silage grass in another place. And I think probably um, that it's not far from being the ideal, uh, but obviously when you get a drought, you, you're looking over the hedge and you've got 80 acres that you'd love to graze and you're forced to cut it for silage. So in, my, in, my, in summary, I would work with the farm that you've got, ideally. Good advice there. We would have some robust discussions, Matthew. Um, <laughs> like firstly, I, I, I might I might be over here now, but I'm I don't work over here. Hundred percent of my work is still with Irish and UK farmers, you know. Like, and that's that's what I know, and that's what I um, that's what I do. Um, and 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 I don't allow my clients to to talk about cover per cow. Uh, so it's funny we would end up having some robust discussions. So you know, you can just see how people get confused because. Um, just so much, you know, uh, contradictory advice and, and discussion in the industry that um, that you really need to know what you're trying to achieve and, and get alongside the right people to do it. Mm. All right, thank you. We won't we won't delve too much into it. Um, so a couple of other questions now uh, on nitrogen and using slurry. Uh, Robert, one for you. Do you anticipate creating new issues with compaction by using a heavy slurry tanker rather than a lightweight tractor and fertilizer spreader? Could a compromise be using an in-house umbilical system with dribble bar or trailing shoe? Yeah, I maybe I maybe wasn't clear actually. It will be it will be a dribble bar. So uh, we've we'll have used a umbilical system from a contractor since about 1992 I think the first one that was ever in Cumbria and we used it from a contractor and we'll have used an umbilical ever since but should have invested in it sooner but it was too busy buying cows and renting farms and putting tracks and stuff in so um, it'll be it'll we've got we'll, we'll have very shortly about 2,000 meters of pipe which will do the home farm um, and all the gear to go with it uh, and and typically we're spending between on each farm 30, 35,000 pound a year spread in slurry. And we were high rainfall with four foot of rain up here. So, you know, we're capturing a lot of rain off, off not just the lagoons, but yard water as well. So there is a saving economically if, if we can manage it within the, the staff that we've got. But if we were to undertake the operation on the other farms as well, it probably, it probably necessitates uh, another person at least. Okay, thank you. And another one for you. Um, you express concern that nitrogen use will become unviable. Do you think you can maintain or indeed even improve net margin using clovers and slurry more extensively, efficiently? Do you know, I don't know whether I can. You know, the, the economics are really difficult. Uh, I'm really impressed by the way the organic guys do this, but I can just see that that's the direction of travel, both from, from a consumer public perspective and from the legislation perspective you know it is seen as the big evil whether or not it is like Andre says or it isn't you know I don't know we've we've got to be more precise in the way that we use these the biggest harmful effect of nitrogen is actually that the hydrocarbon used actually in its manufacture not necessarily in its use uh, and, and that's you know that's the big evil but um, I think we can put our head in the sand and ignore it but it, it's coming you know it's um, when I did my Nuffield in 2012-13, I thought sort of discovered that this was where it, this was the direction of travel, and it's actually probably a lot closer than most of us realise. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think prepare for that for that to come in the future. But the economics are difficult, really difficult, because you know we're we're used to hitting stocking rates and levels of production, and that's what drives the wheel. So you know it's very difficult to contemplate two thirds of the stock and two thirds of the output. 
Yeah. Um, leading on from that, I guess um, someone asks what to do with FYM when using it if on a farm that is mostly grass down. Does anyone who would like to comment that, Duncan? Yeah, well, we, yes, yeah, so we were going to have got that problem this year. Um, Reseed down, didn't quite work. Manure to get out, what we're going to do, we just grazed it down really hard, contractor in, um, and he spread it, basically turned the belts down on the Richard Weston as low as that would go, and the beaters up as high as it would go, and dropped, the, dropped it, went for it. And we were worried we were going to, like, like, you know, the, the grazing afterwards would be problematic, but you never would have known. The girls went in afterwards and we didn't know we'd put, well, you know, what we'd put out there. And I think it's got to be well rotted and if it's spread right, you don't get lumps coming out like big lumps, it's fine. Just don't worry about it. It hasn't got to be ploughed in. Just spread it, but make sure you've got a good bloke on the tractor who knows what he's trying to achieve rather than just chucking stuff out in massive lumps. Yeah, there's another question kind of leads on um, muck contamination on quick silage cuts. Any comments on there or experience? Yeah, that, I think that, that that will be a concern. You're thinking now about grazing cows. Um, I mean, I think if I, if I look back far enough, that was a concern within our group. And I, I know Duncan mentioned, uh, you know, get involved in a discussion group, and it, absolutely a great way of of learning the system and, and learning, well, gaining confidence. I remember when we first moved from having a silage area and a grazing area to having a grazing block that we took silage off to control the grazing area. I think it was a contractor that said, you know, what what on earth are you doing, raking all that up and putting it in the silage pit? But you know, the, cows that are on virtually a grass-only diet, you tend to find the dung packs disappear pretty quickly in any case, and it's never been an issue, you know, it's never been an issue at all. But I can, there's a bit of a mindset thing there when you've never done it and, and then all of a sudden you're going into with the mower maybe a month after you've grazed it or even sooner um, in sort of May or June. Uh, it's, it's something you've just got to get around really. Are you uh, measuring the amount of N in the slurry? Sorry. Uh, we, we have done in the past and we don't routinely do this, but you know, it's, it's something that it's easily, it's easily doable. We tend to have a very watery slurry. There's not a huge amount of, uh, of nitrogen in there, but uh, this is a whole something we've really got to work on. I mean, in terms of covering the thing up and making it, you know, stop diluting it so much, making it, use it, treating it as a valuable resource rather than a waste product, which is the same as FYM really. Yeah, sorry, Matthew, were you going to comment there? Um, I, was just, I was just going to say that we do have plenty of, well, we have to, because, we, because, you, you, we, we, because we're loose bedded on, we, we use straw in our cubicles and we just scrape it all over the edge. We do have to dig the crust. We have this massive five foot thick crust on our slurry lagoon at the end of every winter. Um, but we grow 70 or 80 acres of maize. So we spread that under the maize every year. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, even slurry, it's surprising how you, you see the dribble bar will leave quite thick lines of slurry around the fields, but it, it, the worms get at it and, the, and a bit of rain and yeah, I, I'm not concerned really. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got a couple of questions on your underpass, Sarah and Duncan. Um, you might not want to answer this on, on budget um, and kind of that planning process, um, but also other infrastructure and deciding where tracks should go. Um, so you might want to answer that. Um, did it on Google Earth Pro in terms so tracks, where should the tracks go? We were advised uh, what size paddocks we need to be and then we kind of do put everything around and thought that was the best stab at it, where the tracks should go and we didn't really want really long thin paddocks. So after a few attempts that we made the decision and gone with it. I think we could have probably done it better, but the most important thing is to do something, so we did it. Um, in hindsight, when we when we do the next lot, we've learned certain things like we've got some fences that the cows have to go back almost up a fence to get onto the track that doesn't make sense. So there's little tiny bits that we'll have learned from the first time we've done it, but generally we just got on with it. Yeah, having two ent an entrance and an exit from each paddock was one of the main things that we got told, which is definitely definitely the right thing. And actually having more than two entrances would probably be better. We've got three or four in some paddocks where we can. Yeah. I think you can get consultants in, can't you, to, 
to, you know, who would map the farm out for you and say where you put it all probably, uh, we just did it ourselves, but they would probably be worthwhile. I, I don't know. We didn't look into it. We, we just Google, Google Earth mapped it. Um, we've got some pretty steep tracks as well, where we've just had to go up a steep hill, which wasn't, isn't as bad as we thought it might be. Okay. I've heard um, discussion groups can be quite useful in that as well. If you if you get the group to come around and have maps and see what everyone else comes up with. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely get, get people on the farm. Yeah. And with the underpass, we've put in planning, but it's a bit of an um, unknown at the moment. We basically can't really get fixed prices until we've got the planning and know what highways are going to insist us on doing. Really? If, if anyone, yeah. If anyone's built one. <laughs> Let, let us know. No, I was going to say it was really, it, we can put the design in and you can you get planning for it, but then only when you've got planning for it will you have the equivalent of the building roads people from highways come out and say, we want you to build it like this. Um, and once you build, you know, build it like this and then we'll sign off on it. Now, that level of engineering will dictate how long the road's going to be shut for and how much it will cost. So we, we can get planning, hopefully we will get planning. And then the next bit is, you know, do they want it to better take a 500 ton crane or et cetera? So that's the, the detailed bit is the next bit that we've got to come. But the parish council haven't supported it. So we're really, um, we're, we're making friends around here. <laughs> All right, well, best of luck to you. Right, we've only got a few minutes left. So I'm gonna say, short answers for these next few questions um is the sci so that's the spring carving index breeding the right sort of grazing cow for our panelists yes or no sarah duncan well you'd be you'd be autumn aci right. anyway um we'd be autumn rather than spring but equally just because that's the ideal cow that you want to end up that the autumn carving index that gives you the ideal cow to end up with it doesn't mean that using those bulls on our cows is going to give the right grazing cow. So I think for us, we've had to interpret it slightly more differently according to what we're starting with. So we've kind of made it up ourselves, but they're what we're aiming at, but not necessarily what we want to use. Great plug there for the herd genetic report, which can make that a lot easy, easier. So if you're interested in that, put it in the questions. Uh, Robert, spring, do you use the spring mm -hmm. carving index? I don't, unfortunately. Uh, had a lot of confidence in in breeding worth uh, for a long time. Uh, used a lot of New Zealand team. I mean, and then I would probably have more faith in EBI now than I would the Spring Carbon Index. But uh, I mean, that's um, I, I, I must say I, I delegate a bit of this to one of my managers who understands the bulls and, and does that anal analysis for me. So I'll put that proviso in there. Um, I've, I suppose I've got other stuff going on, and he's more of a, a breeder than I am. So. Uh, but you know, it's, it's a step in the right direction, but I think EBI uh, probably made a better job of it so far. Okay. You know, All right, yeah. thank you. Um, I'm gonna move on to the next one. Do any panelists accurately measure rainfall as it determines grass growth and feed wedge hugely? Hugely, sorry. Um, when do you get best response to slurry? Um, you can do that very quickly. And a question, what stops Robert becoming organic? <laughs> Should I start hmm. with that? <laughs> economic, econ, economics, I've done the sums and it probably means reducing output too big and I'd probably go out of business. And that's, so that's, a, it's, it's through that transition period and lack of knowledge. I don't, you know, it's so easy to stick nitrogen on and it works, I've done it for years and it works, you know, but that's, uh, that's head in the sand. So we've got, to, we've got to have an open mind. Everyone said you've got to have an open mind. We've got, to put, we've got to, some fantastic organic guys out there growing huge quantities of grass and really putting the rest of us to shame sticking nitrogen on. So we've got to learn from them. That's a great answer, thank you. Anyone measuring rainfall? No. I do. I measure, every, I measure everything. Oh, <laughs> we sorry, do, we, we can't, do. can't see you still, Robert. Well, I can't do it. Yeah, we're measuring, uh, we're measuring rain on all, all three farms, really. And uh, it really focuses the mind in the drought, believe me. But uh, yeah, we do. We measure, we me measure rainfall. And uh, it, uh, it's just, you've got to measure everything. It's the whole thing. It's whether it's the, you know, the grass, the rain, the numbers, whatever it is, you've just got to measure it. That's great. Measure to manage. Right. We yeah. are running over, but they're really good questions. So, Andre, really concise answer on what's your reason for 12 hour breaks? Kind of give some technical knowledge behind that. My, my reason? 
Um, I, I, I just think it's practical for, uh, um, especially when you're learning to have cows always going out for fresh break and that if you over allocate that you can change it for the next break to get them back grazing onto it or if you slightly under allocate you can fix it for the next time. Um, and I think it, it, everything's about cow flow like Sarah just said about you know, cows coming out of a paddock having to get back on themselves. Um, it's, it's like that in the milking parlour, it's like that everywhere and if cows know they're going to a fresh break they, they should move through the parlour better known they're going back out to fresh grass. Um, but I think it gives more flexibility and, and a more consistent diet, but more flexibility in controlling over or unradicating as well, really. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, and we'll make this the last one. Do, um, do the panel have any advice on balancing grazing with buffer feeding and keeping cows enthusiastic about grass when they know silage is available? Um, we'll start with Matthew. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a bit of a poison chalice sort of a question. Uh, my advice would be to decide how much you want to supplement and never, never change it until you decide you need to change it again because what, it tends to be a different person doing the supplementing with the silage than it is the person doing the grazing breaks. And you can get in this situation where somebody on the Keenan say thinks, oh, they're a bit hungry, I'll give them a bit more silage. And, the, and so, you, so I would stick quite strongly with say feeding them, I don't know, five kilos of dry matter silage and then make, make the grazing uh, allocation right around that. But there's absolutely no reason, it's perfectly viable to get very good residuals and, and supplementary feed, it's no problem at all. It, but it is more training of the manager than the cow. Okay. We, we learned this the hard way, uh, we learned the hard way trying to graze our whole signs and never ever let the cows be in a paddock grazing where they can hear the feeder wagon. That was our biggest yeah. downfall. You have 300 cows all at the gate, they're like a disaster. But we, ma we managed to make it work just about what Matthew said, yeah. Thank you. Right, well, we'll close the discussion there. If you um, want to pop onto the next slide. So, what now? So, this, um, this panel discussion is part of a series. So, we've got the, the follow up discussion, on, which will be on Microsoft Teams um, on the 17th or 18th. So, I'm sorry, the emails. Um, not very clear there, but it's ke.events at ahdb.org.uk if you're interested in joining that. Um, so please get in touch, that will be next week. And if you let us know where you're about you are in the country, there's two different sessions for the North and Scotland and for the rest of England and Wales. And then in April, we've got a silage panel discussion with expert George Fisher. And in May, we've got a grazing for all year round herds panel discussion with Piers Badnell. So please look out for those if you're, well, if you're on this, you may well um, be interested in the others um, or you might be happy with this. But um, we also have a new resource, which is called Forage First Guide. So I've got Got, got that here. It's a bit of a Bible um, which which covers really everything in grazing and forage. Um, and I think Andre's contributed to that as well. Um, so thank you. And there is a link in the email that we sent in the follow up and it will be available in hard copy soon. Um, so with that, thank you very much to our panel and thank you for all the questions. Sorry, I don't think we got through all of them, um, but it was really great to have you and we might be able to to try and get a response back to you. Uh, there will be a feedback form. It would be great if you could fill it in. Um, thank you so much and good night, everyone. Thank Thanks, everyone.